So I was going to originally just kind of make a super cut of all the ridiculous parts of this video and just post that. But then as I was cutting it all together, I just thought, I can't just let this go. We've got to say something. Hello everyone, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and we are going to talk about this ATF interview with Face the Nation. Now, I actually watched the entire 20 minute sum interview, and I think it's probably worth a watch. I'll try to drop a link. I found it on Twitter in the description below, and you can go watch that for yourself. So you know that I'm not being overly cruel or unfair in how I have edited this, because I've edited it down to about seven minutes of clips that we're going to watch in and out here. And we're going to talk about the lies and incompetence. And before we get started here, uh, this director of the ATF, specifically, I'm going to make fun of quite a bit. Uh, he is either incompetent, like does, unqualified for the job, doesn't know what he's doing, or a liar, uh, or some combination thereof, right? In any event, he is completely, of course, not the person that should be in charge of this organization. Side note, of course, the ATF shouldn't even exist. They uh, exist to police alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. All of those things are perfectly legal, so why do we need a police organization for that? All right, so... Here we go. This looks like a big variety of items here. What, what am I looking at? Uh, so, and Chris is here. He's one of our, our leading experts. Uh, now, right away, right out the gate, you notice that he defers to Chris, the leading expert. If you've ever worked in corporate America, you understand exactly what's going on here, right? Some big honcho comes in, vice president, president, CEO, C-level, whatever, and they actually don't know the technical topic. So what do they do? They bring an expert who knows the technical topic along with them to help them address questions, comments, concerns, right? That's, that's a tried and true tactic. And there's honestly nothing wrong with that tactic in and of itself. However, as you'll see, he defers to Chris multiple times throughout this interview. So Chris, I don't know if you want to walk us through. Correct. So as the director explained, I don't know, Chris, if you want so to. Correct. So correct. Mm -hmm. And Chris, I don't know if you want to show the, 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 the pistols and the, uh, and the Glock switch. Chris, can a person 3D print the entire firearm? How yeah. long does it take to make something like that? Depends on, it depends on the print. Or even looks to him uh, while he's saying something, he'll be saying information, but he's actually looking at Chris to confirm it and make sure he's not getting off track, right? Now, in big corporate America, whatever, I understand why we do that. CEOs have a lot to handle and work on. The ATF is not that big. It's only like one or 2,000 employees, I think, maybe. Uh, you have to look that up. But it's pretty small as far as a federal organization goes. Additionally, we are talking about one of the most contested political issues in the nation. So anyone who is in charge of regulating alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, namely firearms is all the ATF really does, let's all be honest, uh, anyone who is in that role should very, very clearly know exactly what they're talking about. But in late empires, when communism takes over, it, uh, positions of power are not awarded on competence. They're awarded on your allegiance to the political agenda. And that is exactly what you have here, as we will see throughout this interview. Uh, it's one of, uh, it's a, and one of them is sort of the more conventional uh, uh, firearm, mm -hmm. which is uh, sometimes they're, they're under the National Firearms Act, right? And the other one is sort of what I would call the attempt to get around it. Mm. So the way he sets this up is he has these different firearms on the table, right? And he's got like a full auto AK, and then he'll have an AK with a bump stock. And then he'll have a, a registered SBR, and then a pistol with a pistol brace, right? And he's talking about, oh, these things are just ways to get around it. And you know, hey, what we're really trying to do is just enforce the law, right? He's here to push the political agenda. That's all he does throughout this whole interview. How many rounds does it fire? Fully automatic weapon. Mm -hmm. Government can have it, military can have it, it's an antique. Some people, if they had it before, depending on 1986, they can have it, but otherwise, no. So very early in this interview, you understand that the ATF director doesn't actually know the law because, hey, who needs the law when you can just make up rules and make up law as you go? It is 1,000% legal for civilians, you know how much I hate that word, uh, to own fully automatic firearms in America. You have to have some special permitting. You have to purchase one that was manufactured before 1986. That's why they're so ungodly expensive, right? But you can own them. He's saying you can't. That's not true. That's not what the law says. You can own fully automatic firearms. There just has, there's just a mountain of paperwork and uh, permitting to go through. And they're very, very expensive because you have to purchase one that was manufactured before 1986. This one, which looks and operates just like it, yeah. this 
It's a bump stock you're testing. How can you tell that? Sorry, what, what, where's the bump stock? Is there like a physical piece? Of course, right? How can you tell, yeah. right? These two things are the same. They so the director's there, he's gonna talk about, they're the same. That's what they do, they're the same thing. That's not true. Uh, a bump stock operates on one trigger pull per round. You're just pulling the trigger really, really fast. It just helps you do that, right? And you can say, oh, it's just a workaround. There are people who can pull the trigger without a bump stock, just manually, faster than a bump stock. Okay, in fact, that was presented in court. I can't remember if the Firearms Policy Coalition presented that as evidence or if the uh, GOA presented that as evidence, but it's, it's been documented, presented in court. Uh, there are people who can pull the trigger faster. So are we gonna outlaw people's fast fingers now? And both of them can shoot right through this 75 round clip. And both of them can shoot right through this 75 round clip. I continue to love how they call it a clip, not a magazine. It's a magazine. It, that's been like, we just say that till we're blue in the face, but they never seem to get it because they don't know what they're talking about. They don't care that they don't know what they're talking about. And they're just here to push a political agenda. So, These are not loaded. They're not loaded. <laughs> they didn't actually explain to her that the guns aren't loaded before the interview. That's kind of a big deal. If I'm gonna sit down for a news interview thing and I'm gonna have a bunch of guns on the table, I'm gonna explain the four rules of firearm safety to who, who we're interviewing. Because maybe they wanna pick one up. Maybe they wanna actually understand what's going on here so we can have a productive interview. They didn't bother to do that. They didn't sit her down and demonstrate how to check if a gun's unloaded. They didn't sit her down and explain, hey, these guns are all unloaded, just so you know. Uh, this is how we check, let's just check one real quick. These are the four rules of firearm safety. They didn't do any of that. They just put a bunch of guns on the table and started talking to her. Imagine the level of incompetence and stupidity it takes to put a bunch of guns on the table in front of someone who knows nothing and then just start talking and waving guns around. Unbelievable. There is no reason you would use that for hunting. No, I, I do not believe you would use this for hunting. Not for the kind of hunting you're thinking. I mean, my God, why does everybody always go to hunting? The Second Amendment has zero, zero to do with hunting. It was never, hunting was not in the farthest reaches of anyone's mind when they wrote the Second Amendment. You know what was in their mind? Shooting redcoats in the face. That's why we have the Second Amendment. It's pretty obvious, it's pretty clear. People in America should be equipped, able with skills, tactics, gear, etc., to fight and win wars. That's why we have the Second Amendment. If you're curious to learn more about that, I did just write a book that's out right now called Minuteman 101, and you should buy it and read it. So, this is to shoot large numbers of people at once. Uh, Notice how she says there, uh, to shoot large numbers of people at once, right? She's, she's there as a political commissar to help this political agenda along. But Chris, the, the expert, who questionable uh, skills, we'll get to that in a bit. But Chris, he's, even he's uncomfortable saying this. Like, uh, he doesn't even feel comfortable going there. Well, let me just intervene in this. Yes. That's, that's what happened in Las Vegas. So the director needs to jump in to make sure we get on the right political train here, right? Oh, yes, well, just so we're clear, that's what happened in Las Vegas. First of all, we still know nothing about the Las Vegas shooter, right? It's been years. Uh, there, there still hasn't been any actual information to come out of that in any kind of uh, cohesive sense. So that's one. Number two, we still don't know what kind of weapon uh, they, they, he, whoever used in that whole deal, right? They still don't even know their motivation. We still don't know how they got all the guns up. But we definitely know... It was a bump stock. You've got to be joking me. Anybody with the slightest bit of education on the topic knows he's just flat out lying. Uh, what's called a short barreled rifle. Now here he talks about short barreled rifles. Because you can shoulder a weapon, it makes it easier tactically to use, to aim, to fire. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a more accurate, more lethal weapon. And uh, my favorite part here is that when he talks about shouldering the gun, he's like, you can, you can shoulder the gun. He doesn't actually, he, he never held a rifle before, like in a, a real like AR, AK, whatever, like a fighting rifle, right? He doesn't do that. You know how people stand who actually know how to hold a rifle if they're going to mock it up? They stand like this. Right? There's an aggressive lean forward. Like this. when I'm demonstrating in class, I'm teaching classes, I'm like, you're gonna shoulder the rifle, you're gonna move over to this target here, pop, pop, pop. That, that's how we stand, right? It's this aggressive lean forward. It's the same way I would hold the rifle normally. I just punch my hands out because that's more comfortable to demonstrate where the rifle is, right? That's how people demonstrate holding a rifle. How do I know that? Because I've taken dozens of classes and I've done it myself and I've watched myself and other people demonstrate how to move the rifle around. And that's what we do. That's the accepted, comfortable way to do it. You don't go, and then you hold the rifle. Nobody does that. Nobody holds a rifle like that. Who knows what they're doing? Uh, so clearly, he's never actually shot a rifle. Additionally there, he doesn't know what tactical means. 
Uh, it, it makes it tactically easier to use it. What does that sentence mean? Explain that to me. He can't, obviously. It makes it a more accurate, more lethal weapon. Well, not necessarily. Uh, does, it, does, okay, does it easier to hit what you want? Yes, that's why rifles are superior. Okay, so I, I guess maybe we can give him that point. Uh, don't we want guns to be accurate? Isn't that a desirable trait? Doesn't that make them more effective in hitting what we want and not hitting what we don't? Uh, do we want weapons that are inaccurate? I mean, what kind of statement is that? Everybody would agree is a short-barreled rifle because it's sold in one piece. The other one's the exact same thing, but it's sold in two pieces. So people are claiming, no, 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 that's a, that's a, a pistol brace. He has no idea what a pistol brace is. Or again, he's intentionally lying. Uh, a pistol brace, it can come in one piece. You can buy a firearm with a pistol brace attached. That's one piece. W one piece, two piece has nothing to do with what a short barrel rifle is, right? It has to do with the stock and the ATF interp interpretation of the law and, and all of this. It has nothing to do with how many pieces it comes in. But again, he's lying and or just stupid because he's trying to advance a political point. So this is an NFA item, National Farmers Act item requires uh, additional tax stamp for it. Uh, background check, waiting period, registration, registration with NFRTR, and then you have this, which is the GCA version of it, which you could walk into the store and purchase in that configuration. Well, we didn't. People are claiming that they could do that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, w w our rule says that these two things are to be treated the same. I love that it gets to the point like, well, people are claiming that they could do that. They can do that. They had done that. You know how many pistol braces are in circulation? It's something like over 10 million. Uh, so, so this isn't like some kind of far-fetched idea. This is something that the ATF approved formally, right? Went into circulation, went into sale, and now they're like, whoa, hold on, that's not actually. I mean, it's preposterous. Again, though, he doesn't care about truth. You got to remember, these people don't care about truth or logic or reason or the law or any of it. What they care about is manipulating what you perceive to get you to believe what they want. That's it. It's not a good faith discussion. I mean, these look like this here looks like something you'd see in a war zone. This poor interview lady, she, I mean, I know she's here to advance the agenda, so maybe we shouldn't be so gentle on her, but she, uh, the, this, talking about like the ARs and the black ones, right? The, the AK is right next to her, the fully automatic AK, but because it has wood on it, she's like, well, no, the, the black plastic and the metal, that's what's scary. I mean, again, <laughs> nobody in this room knows what they're doing. You see it right here, restricted, Law enforcement, government use only. Same gun here, except this one isn't fully automatic. So, right? So there's nothing on here that says right. only law enforcement. Aha. Uh -huh. Until this thing comes along. This looks like it's a piece of a toy. It does. Like <laughs> I love it that the, the stamp on there, government use only, like that. Oh, that that. First of all, he may, almost makes it sound like that's what makes it automatic. I know what he's saying. He's saying no. That's why we stamped it because it is fully automatic. So you know, only the government can have it because they're only, I don't know what. But then this one isn't. This one isn't written here. You know, uh, so you know that's that's a problem. But but it it all of a sudden. So he's got a fully automatic AR and a semi-automatic AR is what he's showing, right? And then he's like, until this thing comes along, and it's the the 3D printed little dongle thing. You've seen this, right? And um, and then she's like, this looks like a toy. It's just a piece of plastic that goes in. That <laughs> oh my gosh, watching the ATF try to struggle to adapt to the proliferation of 3D printing is hilarious. They, the 3D printing is going to completely end gun control in this country and around the world, to be honest. So this is a privately made firearm. It has no serial numbers, no information on it. Oh. So that's what I didn't even know. That's also a ghost gun. This is a ghost gun. Yeah, see, so this is a ghost gun. Then you can make the ghost gun a fully automatic uh, weapon. Too. I love that he throws out the term ghost gun. Oh, that, that, that's also a ghost gun. I didn't even know that. First of all, that lower looks anodized. Now, maybe I'm wrong, okay? I can't see it. They don't actually show a close-up of it, so I guess we'll never know. But that lower looks anodized. And I'm thinking, I'd like to, I haven't seen a person, I'm sure there's some people that done it, because some of you guys are really autistic, right? But who, who manufacture their own lower, right? Or cut out an 80% and then send it in and get it anodized. So... I'm sure that happens. I'm just saying I have my doubts about that one in particular that they're showing. I also like he talks, he's going to go on here to talk about ghost guns, like they're somehow illegal or they're somehow bad or they're somehow a problem. But the truth is you've been able to make your own guns at home since, you know, forever. 
simply put, there's no serial number on this. So if someone has shot up a group of people, you can't trace this to the person who pulled the trigger. Yeah, that, that, you that's as the federal that, government that, cannot that do is that. generally correct. Yeah. I love how she tries to simplify the serial number discussion. Like, oh, well, you need to trace it to who pulled the trigger. First of all, that's not what a serial number does. All a serial number does is trace ownership of who purchased that firearm, right? It does nothing to prevent shootings. Nothing. Zero. You know, a couple years ago, or maybe a year or two ago, I thought there was some case that came out that ruled that serial numbers don't have to be on guns. Does anybody know an update on that or has heard anything about that? I'd, I'd be curious to know more about that. But I love how she's trying to explain, like, well, then you can't catch the bad guy who did it. Well, in truth, that has nothing to do with it whatsoever. People just have been scratching serial numbers off guns for a long time. Uh, people have been stealing guns, right? Like, the serial number actually does nothing in solving the crime. They already have the gun that did it, right? Having the serial number doesn't really do much. Now, they're going to claim it does, and that's how we do police work and trace the history of it and all this other stuff. But it has nothing to do with the person who actually pulled the trigger. It just has to do with who legally purchased it when and where. And that's it. That doesn't give you much, to be honest. Because if it did, I don't know, maybe they would uh, have less mass shooters, but that doesn't seem to be anything that they actually do. Is a uh, privately made firearm, ghost gun. This, it says, I mean, this feels metal and heavy and significant. This doesn't feel like something that came off a 3D printer. I love that, again, this poor lady doesn't actually know what a ghost gun is. She doesn't understand that they print the, the receiver or the lower part of the pistol, right? The, the frame, sorry, the frame of the pistol. She doesn't understand that. And so she's like, well, it's, it's metal. Like, how do you make this at home? And they're going to go on to try to explain that to her. But again, they did zero prep with this poor lady coming into this interview. This, this is, was manufactured and then the end user can take it with about 20 minutes of time and convert it or make it into a working firearm frame. Okay. And then buy the additional parts to put on the, to create the upper. And then they also installed a Glock right. switch. This isn't just a ghost gun. This is a ghost gun with one of these attached. This is, I love always like, this isn't just a ghost gun. Uh, this is a ghost gun with, with a fully automatic. Like, ghost gun, bad. But fully automatic, super bad, right? Like, <laughs> he just, again, he's there to push a political agenda. This poor lady has no idea what a ghost gun is. She doesn't understand what part is 3D printed and, and the frame that's printed. She doesn't understand that you can buy slides afterwards and put slides and barrels and parts in. Like, she doesn't understand any of that. And she's just being led through this thing. Like, oh my God, this is all so terrifying. It will, you, you'll, you'll pull the trigger once and it will keep firing until there are no more bullets. And, and you can shoot out that magazine, no matter how big it is, just with one pull of the trigger in, in, in fractions of a second. I will say at least he used the word magazine here and not clip again. However, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how big the magazine is, you can shoot out in fractions of a second. Well, that's not true really either. But again, he's trying to make it sound as terrifying as possible. If they're so concerned about Glock switches, how come I keep seeing videos on Twitter of like 13, 14 year old boys in Chicago with their Glocks, all showing off their Glocks with their Glock switches on them? How come you're not doing anything about that? So that's the frame. Can't get this one apart. He's going to make a new gun for you. So you've seen this before because he's gotten a lot of flack for this about how he can't get that first one apart. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to cut him a break here, actually, because he does get the second one apart right away, which makes me think that there was something wrong with the, the first one to, to begin with. But it's still comical, and I love that he says the words, I can't get this one apart, after he tries multiple times. I love that they didn't cut this out and that this all got aired. Um, <laughs> it just makes it better. Now, coming up is actually my favorite part. So basically, what they do is they make this part here. This is like plastic. So this is the plastic piece with about 20 minutes of work. They could make it into a working firearm, and then they could buy the, the aftermarket parts and attach that, simply attach that on. And to buy those. Simply attach that on. And to buy those. <laughs> Okay, this is my favorite part because he's, he's been making this whole argument that you can print this thing at home, you can print the frame at home, then you can just buy a slide and just slap it on there and you're good to go. 
But then when he goes to demonstrate that, the slide doesn't fit. Now, if you've done any 3D printing or you know someone who does, in Minecraft, obviously, uh, you, you know that what the problem is there is, right, there, there's not a fit. There's not a proper fit between the frame and the slide. And some of the tolerances are off or something needs to be adjusted. So it's not, you know, 3D printing is not easy, right? If you're going to do this, there's a lot more work that goes involved into it and refining and, and sanding and whatever. And a bunch of stuff that I don't have the patience for and it isn't for me. But my favorite thing here is they obviously didn't do their homework. They just had this frame, but it was never actually obviously been attached to a slide because it won't attach. So th the tolerances aren't matching up, right? They didn't actually ever er, pre-match this. They don't know where they got it from. It was just some you know, random frame that they had. And he even tries to attach it, but it won't, it won't attach and he just gives up because he realizes he's about to tank his entire argument of how easy and simple and dangerous this is because he can't get the slide on the frame. It's just, again, I can't believe this actually got aired Whoever is in the propaganda department here, my friend, you should be fired and never work again. You failed miserably. If you're selling firearms parts alone, mm -hmm. right, uh, then it's not a frame or receiver. Parts are not regulated. And they're not team. regulated. Under the law, we, we're not allowed to do that. You right? would like to do that? Of course he would like to do that. He would love to regulate parts. He would love to remove all of these things from existence. That's obvious. Um, <laughs> Good luck regulating that stuff, by the way. What we did is we tried to work with what the law that Congress gave us. I love how he goes on to say, we tried to work with the law that Congress gave us, which means we tried to push it as far as we can to control people as we can, but unfortunately, we just can't do that anymore. Like he said, 20 minutes. This is like the thing that even I could do. I love here that he says, oh, this is something even I could do. I guarantee you he could not do it. I, I, I will bet all the money in my savings account. Actually, over uh, parts, it's over what's called billets which is just part of a, is a receiver for, for this kind of gun, okay. for an AR. And it's the sort of the, the unmachined metal part. Okay. Okay. I love, <laughs> again, I can't believe I put that they aired this. So even she is surprised that they're trying to regulate blank steel, right? Like even she's like, mm, okay, well, like she's surprised that they're trying to regulate bare metal before it's machined. Even she doesn't understand that. And it's like, that sounds crazy. Like, it, it, it's just too good. This clip is a godsend. Chris, can a person 3D print the entire firearm? There are some versions of, of firearms that you can 3D print. We do have an example here. That looks like a staple gun. This will do some damage. This will do some damage. <laughs> I love that this thing's in wacky colors. And I have no idea where they got it or whatever. I'd be curious to know what the actual metal parts are on there. If it's just, you know, if it's a one and done kind of deal or whatever. But I love it. He's like, this will this will do some damage. Like, this. <laughs> it's just, he's trying to make it as dramatic as possible while holding this Nerf gun-like thing. It's just, oh man, it's too good. Right? I, I've seen these fellows, you know, uh, fire them at the range. First of all, did you see how he gripped that pistol, right? He had the most limp wrist grip I've seen. He's not actually gripping it like he knows what he's doing. He's never held a pistol before. He's never been trained how to actually shoot a pistol because that's not how anyone who knows what they're doing grips a pistol, right? When you grip a pistol and you know what you're doing, that's how you grip it. See how there's no daylight here, right? I'm gripping the gun all the way up. That's what I'm doing, right? I'm not, it's a little, little, like you're not, I'm not fan, you know, I'm grabbing the pistol how it's meant to be grabbed. You can tell instantly by someone how, how someone picks up a pistol, whether they know what they're doing or not. And I guarantee you that that gentleman has no idea how to shoot an actual pistol. And uh, even some very experienced, you know, there's a huge, these guns aren't made to be automatic weapons, pistols like that, right? And so there's a huge kick up, you know, you see, and so there's a huge kick up, you know, you see. <laughs> Not only does he not know how to shoot a, a rifle, right, with the, but he's not how to shoot a pistol either. He's got his arm bent in here, and there's a, there's, a, there's a kick up. The word he's looking for is recoil. That's the word you're looking for. It's called recoil management, you imbecile. But he doesn't know because he's never actually shot a pistol. He's never been trained how to shoot. He doesn't know what he's doing. He couldn't shoot a gun for the life of him. You, right now, can outshoot this guy on any qual he picks. I guarantee it because he's an incompetent idiot. So who was the owner of this fancy piece of equipment here? This is an example of some of, we have a couple examples of some of the uh, cartel-desired uh, firearms here can on I the table. Can I pick that up? Yes. There's a patron, 
uh, I'm sorry, there's a patron saint of drug traffickers? I went to Catholic school, they never told me that. This looks like, um, what is that? A, a sickle. A sickle? Grim there's Reaper. an owl? A skeleton, yeah, it's a grim reaper. Good are saint. these real diamonds? I don't, I don't know that they are, we'd have to ask. Uh, most of the weapons they, that go to the cartels are are made in the United States. I love that they go into this whole cartel thing. And they're like, well, unfortunately, most of the guns that go to the cartel are, are made in the United States. Gee, I wonder where the cartel got the guns. Could it be the ATF who sold them to them? Do you remember Operation Fast and Furious? Because I do. I remember when the ATF sold a bunch of guns to the cartels and then promptly lost them. And then uh, those guns got used to, I don't know, kill Americans or something. Like, it's just, it's so incredibly great that they brought up the cartels, who they sold guns to. Unbelievable. The, guns would, the cartels would have a lot less guns if the ATF doesn't exist. So we could all just, you know, have that discussion. Considered uh, rifles, and they can be acquired by 18-year-old uh, uh, individuals. You know, and, uh, that seems incredible. Here they're talking about how 18-year-olds can buy rifles, you know, and they got a 50 on the table. But uh, yeah, 18-year-olds can buy guns. That is incredible. God bless America. So those were all the juiciest parts that I could personally find that I thought were worth commenting on. So I hope you've enjoyed this little journey. I hope it's been a wonderful time. Never forget to laugh at your enemies because they are miserable. They are sad. They have no lives and all they can do is lie in order to try to convince people with their lies to do what they want. Imagine how joyless their existence must be. Do brave deeds and endure. Well, thank you for sharing all this with us. It's very educational.